Hello everyone, welcome to today's Novage webinar, Designing 3D Patterns with Rhino and Grasshopper. One of the strengths of Grasshopper, the visual programming tool for Rhino, is their natural ability to process complex geometry data. For this reason, one of its most interesting applications is the creation of elaborate 3D patterns and texture, uh, which as you know are being used more and more in architecture and in product and industrial design. This webinar will give you an overview of different design strategies and workflows used to efficiently develop a library of reusable patterns. And let me tell you a little bit today's webinar presenter. Marco Traverso is an engineer, developer, and 3D designer consultant with over 18 years of experience with the Rhinoceros. In the past seven years, he has developed workflows and tools for integrating the parametric capabilities of Grasshopper into the creative concept design pipelines. His published work is visible at marcotraverso.it and is the founder of Car Body Design, a leading website on transportation design since 2004. And let me tell you a little bit about Novage. Novage is one of the largest online stores for design software, and we offer a huge assortment of software solutions. And as you can see, we offer um, a huge uh, amount of special promotions that you know change every week and um, that really extensive on all of our product cat uh, catalogs products. So come visit us at novage.com. And uh, again, you can find us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you name it. And I also want to remind everybody that I'll be recording this uh, broadcast and you can watch it on Vimeo and YouTube later today. And now without further ado, I'm gonna share Marco's screen. And um, great, Look, looks great already. Thank you, Marco, welcome to the Novage webinar and take it away, we're very excited. Thank you, Barbara. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me. I'm quite excited because I'm realizing that I've been watching Novage webinars for Rhino for a very long time, more than five years, actually. And you've had great presenters like Kyle Ochens and Brian James and Gabe Matthews. So I'm very happy to join them today. Now, today I want to speak about patterns and in particular, how to use Rhino and Grasshopper to create patterns. Now, why patterns? I believe there are a couple of reasons why this uh, topic is quite important today and is very interesting for designers. Patterns are very relevant today as they are becoming more and more part of uh, our current aesthetic language. And we can see many different applications ranging from architecture to product and industrial design, to transportation design, and even graphic design and also fashion design when they are usually associated with the uh, 3D printing methods. So I would say that patterns today are quite trendy. And even if I don't like the word trendy because as designers, we would like to always create something that is timeless. But at the same time, we cannot ignore what's current and we cannot ignore what the world and the market is requesting in terms of aesthetic. So. I believe that being able to, to, to model and to create this type of uh, forms, of shapes, is something that is very valuable today. But apart from this consideration, I also think that patterns are a very, very interesting quality because they combine two characteristics that may appear quite distant from each other. So on one hand, when you see something like this, where you have geometry that is basically made of repetition of singular elements, modules. Our brain is very good at processing it because we are very good at processing pattern in just uh, in nature. So we immediately understand that this geometry is something different from a man-made thing. So why, for instance, if you take a, a car exterior the sculptural shape of the body is something that we perceive as something that has been designed and drawn and sculpted by a man or a team of people. 
when you look at these shapes, you usually associate this design with something more artificial, more machine made. You understand that there is something behind it, a procedure, an algorithm, a, a rule, a mathematical rule that is uh, giving this effect. So this connects the, the pattern design with something like the concepts of uh, future or technology or science gives us that kind of feeling. But at the same time, other types of patterns can have an organic shape and a different uh, look that reminds us of nature. Because if you think about it, nature is full of patterns. I mean, not entirely full, but there are many, many patterns around, especially in vegetation and cellular structure. And so our brain is very, very used to process these very complex shapes quite easily, we immediately see the pattern, the repetition of geometric elements. And so when we see something like this, we not only we see something that is artificial, but at the same time, we feel that there is something natural about it, something organic about it. So I believe that this type of shapes have this duality. They, they combine uh, artificial with natural. They combine man-made with, um, with organic. Uh, and so they're fascinating to me, and I think that you know, can be a very, very uh, good creative tool for coming up with different things. Now, why uh, are we speaking about Grasshopper in particular? So Grasshopper is a visual programming tool and uh, is very good for creating this type of geometry because as uh, uh, Barbara said in the introduction, it's able to process geometry with big number of data. Now, if you think about it, and we have a look at some of the patterns that are shown here, if we think about the traditional 3D modeling approaches and think about modeling something like this using NURBS or meshes, but using a direct modeling approach, now we immediately see that there is a, a challenge because, the, because of the high number of parts, maybe, the, the geometry is not very complicated, but the high number of parts and the fact that maybe we can uh, see some variation going on. And so we need to figure out a way for applying that variation without having to manually scaling each one of these, uh, of these elements, without having to transforming these elements on an individual basis. Now, some programs do have uh, application uh, tools like modifiers or deformers and this can help in uh, processing uh, data and geometry in a non-destructive way applying transformation on uh, an overall and on a single mesh or on a single geometry but usually these tools are quite limited so they are not very flexible they don't give you the ability to create exactly what you want so is there any other alternative method for doing it? Well, a possible different method is to use a programming language. So we can write a script, we can write a macro. And that's perfectly possible. And there is a problem. And in my opinion, this problem rely, is, is basically based on the workflow. Because when you write down some lines of code, your mindset is switching from something that is focused on uh, creating a geometry, designing a thing in uh, three dimension, to translating those steps into code, into lines of uh, uh, functions, variables, combine them together using a syntax. And the very fact that you are typing on a keyboard rather than moving elements on the screen in my opinion, gives the brain something that is, is something that makes, your, uh, make, makes you lose that connection with your original intent. On the other side, when you work with the blocks, so we have here the blocks that build the definition, which is the algorithm inside Grasshopper, you are arranging things in a visual way and the steps that you are creating are very close to the workflow that you would follow on a 3D viewport of a 3D application. <coughs> Excuse me. So this, uh, this fact 
alone makes the use of a visual programming tool very, very exciting because you can just use the right tool for the job. And to me, it's not a case that if you think about it, uh, 15 years ago, we already had all the programming languages of the world and we already had CAD. So we were able, theoretically, there were no technical limitations for creating these patterns. But we see this wealth of uh, patterns everywhere just uh, for since a few years back. And I believe that is something to do with the availability of these new tools. So before diving in and uh, with a practical demonstration, I want to give you an overview of the objectives of this webinar. So the first thing that I want to say is that I don't want to just make a step-by-step -step tutorial because I believe that that would be quite time consuming and we would be only able to cover a couple of applications. On the other hand, I don't want to ju just show a bunch of slides and talk about uh, uh, things because I believe that having a practical demonstration is, is much better. So I will try to stay in between these two extremes and my goal is to give you the best value that I can, that I can in terms of uh, wealth of information. I believe that every one of us has experienced this thing where you are joining a webinar and uh, you really hope that that hour is going to be useful because one hour in today life is, is a long time actually. So uh, I, I hope that I'll be making the most out of it and that you will be making the most out of it and that it will be interesting. So uh, if you have any questions, Barbara is going to handle them. And uh, if something uh, is too fast, I mean, you can always watch the video later if it's something that just needs to be watched one more time, or you can ask a question. We will have a question and answer session at the end, but if it's something uh, that is better to just uh, clear out uh, immediately, then Barbara is going to uh, stop me. So I'm relying on uh, on her for this. Ask away. <laughs> okay, great. So let's dive in and let's move to our Grasshopper file. So we have here our Grasshopper window on the left, and I'm assuming that uh, you have a basic understanding of what Grasshopper is and the general workflow. Uh, so I want to give a uh, a 101 basics introduction. I will start with uh, um, some basic things, but I want to cover a lot of things. So hopefully it will be it will be worth it. So the first thing that I want to cover is the type of um, patterns that is can be considered the most basic one. And in this case, what we have is a series of repeating elements that are disconnected one from the other one. So this is easier to handle because we don't have to worry about the connection between these pieces of geometries. So these are basically individual elements. So I will start with um, something like this. And in this case, what we'll be, crea we'll be creating is something like this. So we have a grid of elements arranged on a plane. And we can see that we have a variation which is applied on the sides of each of these individual boxes. And you can see that this variation is somehow changing along a direction. So we'll see how to build these building blocks that will provide us with the, some basics that will be uh, useful for all more or the more advanced applications. So first thing first, let's see what we have here. So I have tried to organize my definition in blocks so that it's easier to follow. So the basic element that comes out of this block of instructions is this box here, which is quite straightforward because we are creating a basic polygon. We are extruding it. And this basic polygon can change in size, can change in number of segments. And we can also specify a fillet radius. Then we extrude it and then we cut the holes. And so 
we rotate it in order to have it aligned to the axis, and then we have this prism here. And I also prepared an alternative item that we will be experimenting with. So I have this basic element. Now, the other thing that we need in order to get this pattern here is a grid of points that will provide the location of each individual copy. So in order to create a grid of points in Grasshopper, there are many, many different ways for doing that. And here are some basic examples, but among the default components and among the add-ons, you will have a variety of ways for doing that. So here, for instance, we have a square grid and an hexagonal grid, which is the one that we, have, we are being using here, and then a triangular grid. Now, if you notice, we are just taking the points of these uh, uh, components. These are the outputs. We can control here the cell size, the count uh, of the elements along the two directions. And the points have been flattened which means that they are come structured in a list uh, which is arranged in rows and columns, but for the purpose of this demonstration, we will be using simple lists. So just in case you wonder what this arrow is. I won't go into detail about the data structure because I believe it's not a part of uh, the, the goal of this webinar, but if you have any question, then please feel free to ask it. So basically, how we can we create the pattern given these two basic elements? Now, let me go here and so that we can just start from scratch. So we have these base elements and we have a grid of points. Now, in order to create the, and I'm sorry, I'm going to hide this. In order to create the, the grid of elements, we need to copy this element to these point locations. To do that, we are going to use a very basic component, which is the move tool. Because actually, we are not moving, but we are creating a copy here based on a motion vector. So the geometry that we want to move is our base element. And we want to move it to this grid of, of points. And in this case, the vector is equal to the coordinates because we start from the origin. And so when I click on it, I basically, in one step, I've made all these copies. And here I want to show you something that uh, we are going to see every time here. We have created a number of elements. In this case, it's, uh, the, total, it's the total of 72 elements with a single, just with a single component. Now, if you know a little bit about, about programming languages, you know that if you want to do the same thing writing a macro, you probably would have to write a four next cycle uh, in order to just cycle through all the points here and then apply that, mm, that uh, transformation. So you can see that compared to writing lines of code, this is much more intuitive. And here, in my opinion, lies the, um, the, the, the factor here, the, the, the importance of the use of a visual programming tool. Okay, so once we have this pattern, we want to add some variation to it. And uh, in order to do that, let's go back to our image here. Now, if you look at different examples of patterns, you usually see that the variation depends on the position and it's, it's a gradual change of the geometric properties. It could be the size, like in this case. It could be also rotation. It could be something different, but it always relies on uh, the position. So basically, in order to connect this transformation to something tangible, we can connect it to the distance from a given piece of geometry. These geometries are called attractors, and we can use points or we can use curves to generate this variation. And I want to show you both these, uh, these cases. So I'm going to create a point inside Rhino. I'm going to hide this. So I'm going to create a new point here. And I'm going to reference the point from Grasshopper by importing an empty point parameter. Right click on it, set one point, select it. And now we can see that it's highlighted, which means that 
it's inside Grasshopper. So when I click on these components, the Rhino viewport is just used for displaying what's going on inside Grasshopper. This is geometry that is not inside Rhino. I cannot select it. Just in case someone is wondering if, uh, uh, if it's not familiar with the workflow. So we are using Rhino primarily as a display for what's happening here, for debugging this algorithm in real time. So once we have this point, we want to calculate the distance. So we use the distance component and I'm typing here in the search box because to me it's faster than looking for the component in the toolbar, but you can find all these components arranged in the toolbar uh, in different categories here. And so we can connect the first point, which is this attractor point, and then we can connect the grid of points in the second input. Now what we have here is a list of uh, numbers that represent the number, the distances between each point and uh, the attractor point. So this will affect the, the behavior, the transformation that will be applied to each one of these elements here. So if I want to change the scaling factor, I would need uh, numbers that can range for instance, from zero to one. And so these numbers here are different. So how can I transform this list of numbers into something that can be used as a scale factor? Well, in order to do that, we can use a remap function that does just that. So we indicate a list of numbers and we have a source interval of, uh, uh, of numbers, which is called domain. And then we have a target domain. Now, for the source, we need to provide an interval that describes this list, then includes all the number in this list. So basically, we want to go from the minimum distance to the maximum distance. And we can use a specific component, which is called bounce, that gives us just that. So I can use another panel here, and I can see that these distances range from 5 to 77, 67. So this is going to be our source, our range, starting range. And the target range by default is set from zero to one. And so if I use another panel here, you can see that all these values have been remapped from zero to one. The maximum value is the first one and it, uh, it has become one. And then go a little, the list goes on like that. So now in order to use it to scale the basic pattern, we can use a global scale component and we need to provide the geometry and the geometry is the output of the move tool here. And this geometry needs to be scaled around each individual center because otherwise what's happening here is that the entire pattern is being scaled starting from the default center, which is the origin. We don't want that. And the default factor is 0 0.5, which is uh, a fixed number. So in order to change that, we need to provide these two inputs. So what we want to do is to provide a list of centers, which is the same list of points that we see here. So we can just connect these two components. And then we can use the remapped values here. Now, what is happening here is good. The direction is right, but there's something in order that going on that is not perfectly fine. First thing first, we have an error going on here. And uh, that's because the closest element has been scaled by a factor of zero because, because we have used a range that goes from zero to one. And basically it has disappeared. And that's the first problem. The second problem is that um, I don't particularly like the fact that these elements are very, very small. So how can I control this uh, scaling factor? I need to specify a minimum scale factor and maybe also a maximum scale factor. So how can I do that? Well, let's introduce a couple of sliders that are the inputs that allows us to uh, go to, to, to specify variables basically. And I want to go from 0 0.1 to 1. And I make a copy by dragging and tapping on the Alt button. And I'm using this to create a range, which is the construct domain component. 
and I'm connecting these two to the inputs. And then what I have here, if I use a panel, is a range that goes, in this case, from 0 0.1 to 0 0.7. Now, this is our target range for the scale factor. So if we look at this remap numbers component, we are remapping the distances from their natural interval, from minimum to maximum, to a target domain. Instead of using 0 to 1, we can just delete this and connect this domain here. When we do that, if we select the scale, we can see that something has changed. And then if we move this slider, you can see that we can control the minimum scale factor and the maximum scale factor. We can also invert them so that we could go from big to small as we move away from the attractor point. Now, this attractor point can be moved right inside the Rhino viewport and we can create different effects with this radial variation. Now, what if I want to do something different? What if I want to have a variation that goes along a direction? Now, in this case, what I want to do is to introduce an attractor curve. So let's see what's different. I want to select the pattern so that you can see what's going on here. And I want to just draw a simple line and I want this line to be an attractor for the pattern. So I'm going to use a curve component here. Right click, set one curve. Now it's highlighted in here inside Grasshopper. Now I need to calculate the distance between each one of these points and this new curve. In order to do that, I need a component that is called curve closest point. So I have two inputs. So I have the grid points as input, and I have my attractor curve as a second input. Now, among the different outputs, I'm interested in the distance. So now this distance is going to be similar to the one that we have seen here. So a bunch of numbers that depends on the position of the point. Now, all that we have seen before can be applied to this uh, distance here. So I'm going to just rebuild the same exact sequence just so that it becomes a little more clear. And so we need to remap these numbers. So we need to remap the distance. We need to find the interval, the range that goes from the minimum to the maximum here. So we need the bounds component. And this is going to be connected here in the source. And as a target domain, I can use the same custom domain that I have created here. So now I can make a copy of this uh, component here. And instead of using this scaling factor, I'm going to use the new ones. When I do that, you can see that now the variation is uh, changing in a linear way. And here I have set the minimum value to zero, and that's why we had that error. So now what happens is that I can move a line and I have this linear gradient. And I can also transform this line by changing its degree, for instance, to three and activating its control point. It can become a curve. And now this curve is going to affect the pattern in a different way. And in this way, it's possible to really sculpt the variation in size. Now we are using the variation in size because it's quite simple to see and uh, we just need a scaling factor. But we can use this exact same method for changing the position, the rotation, change, changing properties of individual parts of these elements. So the only thing that we need to do is to basically use a different uh, target range of values that make sense. For rotation, we will be using rotation angles. Or for a position change, we will be using linear units. So in this way, we can apply these, uh, these variations to several to different properties of this basic element. OK, so once we have done that, let's make, uh, let's make something different. Because as uh, so far, we have created 
a pattern that is lying on a plane. Now, what if I want to create something that is not on a plane, but lies on a complex surface? Well, actually, it's pretty simple to do because instead of copying this uh, pattern to a grid that lies on the world XY plane, we are arranging items on a grid of points that is uh, uh, built on a surface. In order to do that, here we have the same basic element that we have seen before, and the grid of points is built in a different way. So we have a target surface, and we have the divide surface component that takes as inputs a number of divisions and divides the, num the NURBS curve along the U and V direction. So the distribution of control points depends, uh, of these points depend on the distribution of the control points of the NURBS surface. Then, we can use these points here, but this is not enough because we don't want just to copy the base pattern to this new location. We also want to orient them so that they are oriented, for example, along the normal to the surface. In order to do that, we can use the evaluate surface component and calculate at each individual location of the point, the tangent plane, which is this frame output here. Now, this is a visualization of a plane. And then instead of using the move tool, we are going to use the orient component. This is similar because we can get a base element, we can uh, provide a base element. The source is the source plane, which in this case is the one set by default to the world XY. And the target plane is going to be this list of different elements. When we do that, the target plane also contains information about the location because the planes have their origin in the grid points. So we can build this base pattern with a single step here. Now, what can we do with this? Well, we can do whatever we want because right now we have the same exact things that we had before, a basic pattern, which is a list of individual elements, and we have grid of points. So we can use, for example, the same attractor point workflow. So we have the distance, we remap it uh, to the, we find the domain, we remap it to a target interval that is set here from 0 0.4 to 1.4. And then we apply the scale factor. And we can see that this is our variation that is um, driven by the attractor point. Or we can use an attractor curve that is here, and that give us a different type of variation here. And we can always change the location of the point, or we can shape the curve here and add the visual feedback of the resulting geometry. OK, so let's make one step further. And Let's have a look at what you have here. And let me just hide this curve. Now, if we look at this, um, this geometry here, we can see that the variation that we have starts from the minimum scale to the maximum scale, and it's linear. Now, this means that I can control only the starting point and the ending point, the ending scaling factor. But the remap component is remapping numbers in a linear way. Now, maybe I don't like that. Maybe I want to have a different a smoother variation at the beginning, or maybe I want to have something that has a different uh, distribution of change. So in order to do that, we can use graph mappers. Now, let me just show you how we can do that. So here we have our base pattern, which is built on a surface. In this case, we are using small spheres. These are meshes. And we have a grid of points. So we start always with, with this, uh, the same two com base component. So now we want to remap the numbers. But before we do that, Let's introduce the graph mapper. Because the graph mapper is a special input 
that allows us to use different types of graphs. I'm going to use the most basic one, which is the Bezier curve. And you can see that by moving these handles, we are able to specify a different, a different variation curve. Now, the problem with the graph, the graph mapper is that this is working with numbers that come here in the input. And the two axes range from 0 to 1, both on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis. So we need to make sure that the numbers that we are providing here are mapped from 0 to 1. Now, these numbers will be mapped here along the x. And then the resulting number for each one of them will be the correspondent value on the vertical axis. So we will have numbers that range from 0 to 1 as input, and we will have number that range from 0 to 1 as output. So how can we do that? Well, if we take the distance and we introduce the remap numbers component, we can see that we need we still need to specify the bounds, so the original range of values. But the default target domain is 0 to 1, which is exactly what we want, because now all these values range from 0 to 1. So we can use the graph mapper. So we can connect them to the graph mapper. And now the problem is that and I'm making a copy of this. Now we have as an output, we have a list of numbers that is still ranges from zero to one, but you can see that, for instance, one has remained one because we are here and this is the correspondent value. But as we move here, we have a different distribution, a smoother distribution at the beginning, and then we have a different rate of change, and then we have a smooth distribution again. Anyway, we need to remap these numbers because we need to sp specify, again, the minimum and the maximum value. So now we need to introduce a second remap component. And in this case, the original value that we want to remap is uh, the remap, the, the output that uh, comes out of the graph mapper. The source is 0 to 1, and the default value is good for us. Now the target we can use just the custom domain that we have created with the sliders. So I can just connect this to this. And now what I can do is, again, create a scale component. We want to scale this base pattern here. We want to connect the grid points that act as centers of the transformation, and then we want to use these factors here. Now, let's see how this works. In order to see that, we can just move this slider here and see what happens. So as we move this, you can see that we are changing the variation along the surface. And I'm zooming in a little bit, so hopefully you can see what's happening here. Now, this is already something very interesting. But we can also get a bit crazy, and we can specify different graph types. For instance, we can use a sign here. And now, if I take this handle and just move it towards the left, I can introduce a wavy pattern very easily. So graph mappers are a very, very easy way for visually sculpting our patterns. Now, we are working on something basics, but this idea, the application of this workflow, uh, is something that you can do with whatever geometry you're working, even if it's something uh, more complex. OK, so I don't know if it, there is any question, or I can go ahead and see if, if the, uh, the speed is, uh, the pace is right, if uh, it's too fast or if you are happy with it, in case Barbara will let me know. Yeah, now, for now, I want to show you. Yes, let us know. We, we have no questions so far. OK, great. Thank you. OK, so now I want to show you a different way for creating patterns. 
until now we have created individual elements but now we want to operate on a surface because that's the most interesting uh, application so let's see what we can create now before we do that i wanted just to point out how for instance this uh, pattern here which is a recreation of uh, a design shown by bmw with a recent concept car is exactly what we have seen to uh, what we have just seen because this pattern is made up of uh, individual elements that in this case are pairs of triangular pyramids and there is an attractor point somewhere here that is driving the scaling operation so that we as we move far from the point this couple of elements are scaled up now in this case we also have some trimming here but the basic idea is uh, exactly what we have seen so far so now let's switch to something different and now we want to operate on a surface and we want to introduce some kind of variation on it so how can we do that well there are many many ways for doing that and uh, some of them actually are quite interesting because uh, you make use of uh, several paneling options that starting from a target surface that we have here can create in a single step a panelization that can be used as a basis for our pattern now these three different uh, components come from the plugin that is called lunchbox which is this one here and it's a free add-on and it's one of those uh, must have things that you need to install when you work with grasshopper because it has many many useful things and among these are these uh, panelization tools so just starting from a surface in one shot we can create these uh, quad panels or we can create diamond panels or we can create even random quads here and we can play with the seed to have different uh, different distribution of quads now we are going to use these panels here and we need to find a center for each one of them because as we have seen we need a grid of points that will act uh, as centers of transformations so in this case i'm applying the area component to each one of these panels in order to find not the area but the centroid of them and we can use the same workflow for all of these panels so we have we can have a choice of quad panels with the corresponding centers or diamond panels with the corresponding centers or random panels with the corresponding centers so again we have this block here this logical block which can be reused and then we are using these placeholders that are the geometry we, so this means that I can uh, provide mesh or surfaces, B reps, the geometry type, which we can find here, is a placeholder for all of these types. So it's something quite interesting because we can switch type of element without worrying too much about the type of geometry. And then we have this grid of points. So now we can operate in exactly the same way we have seen so far. So in this case, I have applied an attractor point to scale the panels and I have found something like this and I'm able again to change the distribution here by moving the handles here on the graph mapper now what can I do with this well now it's really a matter of design decisions and it's it's basically it's the fun part <laughs> because we can do many, many different things. Just an example here, what I've done is to take these um, scaled down versions and I have calculated the, off the, the normal in a similar way to the one that we have seen before. And I have calculated a vector and use that vector for offsetting these surfaces. Now, this second offset surface has been turned into a curve and then I have taken the original pattern, transformed into a curve, which is a polyline actually. And then I have merged these two lists in pairs and the arrows that you see here are 
uh, needed in order to not create a single list of elements, but just join in pairs the corresponding elements and are called grafting. And is again, it's related to the data structure and uh, it's something that it will be covering if needed. Okay, so what we can do now is to apply the loft command. Now the loft command is taking the pairs of uh, uh, of polylines, which in this case are this one here, and let me use the line tool, which is a bit better. <laughs> this one here, and this is repeated many, many different times, and it's creating this frame, this set of four angled uh, planar walls. What we can do is to for instance, take this polysurface and join them together with the original offset surface that we have created here. And so we have this interesting shape, this panelization. And as you can see, the point attractor is still working. So we basically can apply separately the panelization and the applying a, a variation of the scale driven by an attractor point. So another thing that we can do just to give you an alternative, a possible alternative is uh, to take the original polylines, the contours of the cells, I'm scaling them down by fixed factor here. And then I'm going to use these two curves. Again, I mm, merge them in pairs and I am I'm creating this uh, frames that are following uh, the, the surface. And then I can use the same scaled version here and pair with the other curves that I have created before. And again, I merge them in pairs and I use them, no, not this one, sorry, but this one here, I'm using to generate this new polysurface. And then I'm going to select both of them and merge them together. And now I have something different where basically I have this rib going on. So there's no limit to what you can do once you have the base pattern and a center point for transformation. You can operate on multiple elements at the same time. And this is the strength of Grasshopper because we are working right now with uh, over 150 elements. And we are able to change parameters in real time and see what happens visually with a almost visual, uh, almost uh, instant feedback. Okay, what can we do more than that? Well, there is another type of panelization that uh, is available with Lunchbox. And let me just start over again with the, our surface. And it's called hexagon shells. Now, compared to the, the, um, the ones that we have seen before. And before I do that, I, I wanted just to show you uh, another thing here. Sorry about that, but I, I think it's quite interesting. What I can do once I have built my parametric definition, I can always go back here at the beginning. And here when I'm defining the set of uh, panels and the, uh, the set of center points of the grid, I can just use a different set of panels and a different set of points. And now I'm basically applying the same rules to a different set of, uh, to different basic geometry. So this means that if you separate your definition in blocks, logical blocks connected by these nodes that are connection points, between the, the logical blocks, it's quite easy to come up with uh, a library of uh, algorithms that you can use in different ways, like building blocks. Okay, hey, now Michael, I want I want to see. While, yes? you're, while you're there, how can you add tightness to the surface? Uh, that's what we are going to see right now. Right. <laughs> it's the it's right in this example. So we are going to see it right 
here we have a thick surface okay so in this case what i have is not a surface but these hexagon cells is going to give us a, a list of curves that are these polylines right here now we always need our center points for uh, for our transformations and in this case i'm going to calculate the center points using the polygon center component so i have these curves and i have this grid of points now again i'm basically i'm just copying and pasting all this block here and then i'm just connecting these two components now what i want to do now is uh, applying the same rule that you have seen before so we have an attractor point which is this one right here and we apply it so that we are scaling the curves and then we are matching them merging them in pairs and we are using the loft tool to create these frames which are poly surface made by one two three four five and six surfaces now Obviously, I can do something with that. For instance, I can create a point in the center. I can take the points, the center points. I can offset them of a given value along the normal. And then I can use the extrusion to point component, for instance, to create a shape like this, if I like it. Or I could actually, uh, instead of using a, a constant offset value, I could drive this value through an attractor point and if we go back to this image that's exactly what we have here because here we have this hexagonal panel and we have a frame here that uh, gives us this rib effect and that's the recessed effect here is uh, achieved by the creation of an offset point and you can see that as i move from top to bottom this point is offset here is zero and so the surface is almost uh, coincident with the starting reference surface and then we have a depth that goes up and we can control this this smooth variation is achieved through an attractor curve in this case so we have an attractor curve that goes like this and as we move away from it we uh, have this depth that is increasing another very interesting thing in this case is to use uh, this pattern that we have here just to add thickness as uh, someone was asking so how can we do that well obviously this is a surface so a possible way for doing that would be to use the offset surface but that's not the right way for doing that because that is going to be long as a computational uh, in terms of computational time and just we don't need it because actually the geometry is made in this case with straight edges so now we can transform everything into a mesh using the simple mesh component so the geometry is exactly the same because it's defined by a set of vertices but now we can operate on this mesh using a set of tools that is uh, very very interesting and many of them come from the weaverbird plugin by giulio piacentino who did an extremely great job on with this uh, plugin and 99% of the definitions that use meshes in Grasshopper, I bet they are using some of the tools that he made. And what we can do here, for instance, is use the thicken tool to add thickness to this mesh. And if we look at this slider that is defining the distance of the thickness of the thickening operation, you can see that as I move it, the result is instant. Not only that, we can also see exactly the time that is spent on this operation. It's six milliseconds. It's really real time. So using meshes has the great benefit of speeding up things quite a lot. Not only that, but we can apply uh, subdivision algorithms like the Katmul Clark subdivision, which give us a smoother uh, mesh by interpolating the point. Now, there's no time to cover it in detail, but it's very, very interesting. But the basic is that if I have a cube here and I apply the smooth, uh, this, um, 
the subdivision algorithm, that cube is going to be smoothed out. Now, we can control the way it's smoothed out by, for instance, controlling the density of the initial mesh. So if there's no density, the interpolation brings us to something that is so smooth that it's basically collapsing to a almost spherical uh, shape. But if we increase the number of edges, the interpolation makes, uh, uh, it's done in, in a way that the result is closer to the original mesh. But we have these nice filleted edges. They are not filleted, but they, they are rounded somehow. And this is great because we can get, uh, can avoid these ugly uh, sharp corners that give away uh, the, the, the CGI often. So we can do that. And this is something almost uh, uh, very, very uh, important right now because many programs and Rhino is uh, going to have it uh, in the next version and has already some of these tools available, but basically are able to work with these subdivided meshes and turn them very quickly into NURBS, which means that then you can operate with all the NURBS tools. So this is something very interesting, but again, it would require an entirely different webinar. Marco, for what we want to, yes. Marco, sir. back to the hexagon, I have a question. Yes. Why do you use the polygon center component instead of the mm -hmm. centers from the hexagon cells? Oh, there is a reason. That is an, a nice question because uh, there is a subtle, subtle reason actually. Now, if you look at the centers, you can see that along the edges, the centers are located here. This means that if I'm using these points that you can you see here, when I'm scaling the elements that are on the edge, these elements are going to be scaled starting from this point here, which means that this edge will remain there. So we will have an overlapping of edges in this area and that will result in a bad geometry. While if I select, uh, while if I calculate the polygon center, now the center for, for, for the internal hexagons, it's exactly the same, but for these hexagons that are not hexagons, actually, they are uh, uh, four edge surface, four edge polylines. The, now the center is actually in the center. So when we are scaling it, and let me select both of them so you can see what happened here. This edge is going to be offset and that gives us that nice look. If I want to see what's happening here, I can just use this as our grid points. And now you can see that when I look at what's happening here, everything seems normal, but we what we have here is two edges, two faces overlapped. And in this case, This gave us, for instance, a problem right here because now the pyramid are done in a different way. So it's not what we expect. And here the conversion to a mesh in this case is, uh, is also a problem because you get all these overlapping elements and that's because the, the edges here are overlapping. So the problem was in the edges. So that's why I, I'm using the geometrical center rather than the center of the cell. Excellent. I hope this makes sense. Yeah, it okay. does. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so now we have here, and I wanted to use the subdivision algorithm just to uh, give some round edges to this surface. How can I do that? Well, we have seen that if we apply the directly the subdivision algorithm, then we are going to lose the hexagon shape. So in order to keep it, we need to increase the density of the mesh, as we have seen with the, the tube example. In order to do that, what we can do is basically use a different type of subdivision that is provided by Weaverbird. It's the constant quad split subdivision, which is a very long name for something that is quite intuitive. This basically adds density by creating additional edges through the midpoint of the existing edges. And then when I, once I have increased the density, I can apply the Cutmull-Crux subdivision. And you can see that now we start to see 
our hexagonal shape. And if we increase the density a little bit more, then we see that we can have something quite nice because we have the hexagonal shape, but we also have these corners that are smoothed out. And I can also go farther and have something like this. And then whenever I want, I can just bake this mesh and I need to exit the current command in Rhino before I do that. And when I bake it, I have a mesh here in Rhino. And if I switch to a render view, you can see that we can use this, uh, this mesh for checking out the geometry that we have. So maybe we can use the meshes temporarily so that we have a very fast workflow. We, ha we have an instant feedback and then we can switch back to NURBS if needed. Okay, so uh, I was just, uh, we are already uh, into the one hour target. So uh, I want to show you some other examples, but uh, I will be quite fast. I will just give you an overview of, of, of other workflows in a couple of minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer if you like. So for instance, another way for creating patterns is the creation of something along the plane. In this case, we have a solid with a pattern of holes. And then we can use a target surface and we can morph that solid onto the final surface. And when we do that, we are using an operation that is going to take a while because it's four seconds. And, but we are creating basically in one step a surface with all these holes. Now, possible problems, as you can see, can include uh, a deformation, and these uh, can depend on the structure of the uh, of the nerve surface, the target surface. So, in this case, if we have a different version, which has a more uniform distribution of control points, then we can have a different uh, a different result. So, sometimes. We need to just check our original surface because that is going to affect the way that the, the pattern, the geometry is going to be morphed into the target surface. Another example of the interesting use of meshes, we can see here that if we, before applying the, uh, the morphing operation, we transform this solid into a mesh and then we applied exactly the same operation with the morph component, if we have a look at the time that is needed to perform the operation, we go from 3.6 seconds to 35 milliseconds, which is exactly 100 times faster. So I really think that meshes need to be taken into consideration when working with these things, even if just for evaluating uh, a design, because 35 milliseconds means that we can have an instant feedback on that. So we can change the properties, we can change the fillet edge, uh, uh, with the fillet uh, radius, we can change the number of segments, we can change the tractor points, we can do whatever we like, and we have a very, very fast feedback. Okay, so I wanted to give you a last overview of other possible applications. And I've been creating different patterns for a series of images that I've been posting recently uh, from the um, beginning of this year. Uh, in the with the parametric daily tag and uh, these are all shapes that are different in the sense that require different workflows some of them are very complex but they can be made very easily and other appear quite simple but they are quite tricky to uh, to build so i want to just make a couple of comments on those and if you want to see something, I'll be happy to show them and you can, you can write down in the chat. So for instance, in this case, what we have is a, a division with quads, like we, the one that we have seen before, but instead of using that surface as is, we have taken these points and then we have taken one of them and offset, like we have seen for the center point of the hexagons, by a certain value. And then we have used those points to create polylines. And this means that we basically have 
triangular surfaces. And this is what we have right here. Now, again, in order to have something with this fillet here, with the rounded corners, uh, I wouldn't ever use a solid fillet command here because you, it's something you just don't want to do that. But instead, we can convert this to a mesh and we can apply some of the available tools with uh, Weaverbird. In this case, we are applying a couple of subdivisions that are going to create these supporting edges. And then when we do that, we are increasing the density just on the corners, which means that then when we apply the sub cutmole crux subdivision, we are having this fine subdivision here, this fine smoothed edge. And even if it's very intricate, the algorithm still works quite well. And this is a watertight mesh, and this is pretty good if you want to 3D print it. And maybe it can also be produced if the requirement in terms of quality is not that high. And let's remember that uh, subdivision surfaces, when uh, are converted to nerves, they are G2 continuous. So they can be used for production, actually. And this is a very interesting thing, very interesting technology. Marco, yes. I have a question. How many control points in the second option versus the first option? Uh, which options? Sorry. Um, that's the question. Is how many control points in the second option versus the first option? I don't know what um, Matthew uh, said which... from the previous example. Okay, let's go back to the previous one and. Uh... I don't know what is the exact example that we are speaking about. Matthew, if you can give more details in your question. Are you talking about the hexagon or? The hexagons? I don't know. I am, I'm asking. Um, OK. Matthew, if, if you can clarify, we're here for you. OK, let's see. The sur surface points, he says. The surface points that are uh, here. Yeah, uh, maybe from here to here. Yes. The distribution of control points. Well, in this case, I have rebuilt the surface right inside a uh, grasshopper here with 100 points. Now, obviously, when you rebuild a, a surface using that, that kind of numbers, you are not going to get a nice result. But in this case, it was for demonstration purposes. Now, if I go here on my list of uh, layers and switch this thing here, and uh, I can show you the original surface, which is this one. And if I activate the control points, you can see that I, on purpose, I basically slided this set of control points very close to the border so that the effect, the distortion was quite uh, quite evident here. And then when you rebuild it with 100 um, control points, you can see that you get something that is, it's not usable, but it, it just gives you uh, an example of how you can uh, limit the distortion. There is actually another thing that can be said. If we are using meshes uh, for the morphing operation, it doesn't matter if we are using a, a clean nerve surface as a target or a rebuilt surface with thousands of control points because what we are doing basically, we are just moving points. So the mesh does not does not know anything about the target surface. So it's quite useful, this method, if it's combined with the mesh, because the, the result is not going to be more complex because we have used a target surface with more control points. That is another benefit of using meshes in these cases, for instance. So I hope this answers the question. Yeah, looks like it. But Matthew, yep, thank you, says Matthew. Okay. Okay, so Let's go back here. And now these things uh, can be pretty elaborate. And sometimes similar, uh, com uh, similar patterns require completely different workflows. For instance, this pattern right here or this pattern right here, 
needs basically a construction of an underlying geometry which is to be done basically manually and then you have to offset and to create an array of elements to create this final shape on the contrary this thing can be done in just a couple of steps because there are two components that creates this uh, truss structure and then create a mesh pipe around those lines and then we are just applying a subdivision uh, catmull class subdivision and we get this effect so sometimes it's difficult to understand when something takes 10 minutes or when it's going to take 10 hours and this is pretty interesting to me and this is another um, case where something that is particularly simple from us from intuitively we can describe this geometry as straightforward but we have something going on here because starting from these curves we need to offset those curves and find these uh, edges but we need to find the correct offset value so that when we create those lofts they are meeting at the point instead of uh, uh, meeting on, at, on three different points so we need to create some uh, geometric construction to do that so this is uh, something that to me is interesting because sometimes we have the feeling that there is a magic formula, there is a magic bullet that allows us to create whatever pattern we want. And the reality is a bit different uh, because each individual case is different. So you have to know a lot of different workflows. And for instance, this, in this case, we have something that is extremely complex, but this is a, a mathematical uh, figure, geometrical figure, which is the geroid, and there's a formula for that. And once you implement that formula, then it's going to take really, it's relatively simple to do that because we are ju just projecting a, a basic cell onto a given geometry. But that basic cell is very complicated, but it's just a different formula. So this is uh, an example of the mm, designs that I've been posting um, on my site and on the uh, Instagram and the different social uh, social networks and uh, I wanted to give you this overview because I feel that it's important to understand that there is no magic formula and that there are many different workflows involved in the creation of patterns uh, sometimes we also can operate directly on nerve surfaces and modify the position of the contour points for instance to create a, to sculpt that surface. We always rely on the grasshopper's ability to work on multiple data, multiple geometries at the same time. And I really believe that this thing, the fact that uh, there is no universal definition, is not a bad thing actually, because it gives value to, uh, to our work as designers, because if it was so simple, then maybe the value would have been uh, a bit smaller and so I don't think in the end it's something that uh, needs a bit of uh, time to be to get familiar with and you also need to be switching to a slightly different mindset and uh, but if if you like that kind of uh, workflow if you have that kind of mindset it can also be very very rewarding and also very very addictive because you you always wonder okay What's the next step? What can I do next? And sometimes for a designer, what I say to designers that come to me that are uh, following my classes is that uh, sometimes you just have to stop because uh, you don't want to, you, you want to create a, a design, you want to complete your job. So you don't have to focus too much on, uh, on the definition. Uh, so it, it can be addictive. So I wanted to thank you really, uh, I want to thank Novage for having me, it was really a pleasure. And uh, uh, before I uh, say, uh, before we go to the question and answer, I just wanted to tell you that um, I'm offering custom training through my website and this is, can be on-site training for companies or studios, but also individual training classes uh, hold, hold, held remotely via Skype. And I'm working on an upcoming course that will be just about the creation of patterns. So if you're interested, it will be an interactive course. Uh, so we will be having webinars like this, private webinars with interaction, with email mm, support, visual mm, video feedback. And if you are interested, you can go to 
the URL that you see on the on the page and just fill in the form and I'll be happy to give you more information. And also, if you need any 3D parametric design service, you can contact me directly by email or visit my website and see the kind of work that I'm, I'm doing it there. So I don't know if there is any question, I'll be very happy to answer. Yeah, there's a couple. Thank you, Marco. And please, everybody screenshot this page and, uh, you know, tape it on your refrigerator. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, which is the best tool to convert for, from complex mesh to NURB surface? Okay, so uh, we are speaking, there are uh, two different options. Uh, when we have a mesh, we can have something like this, which is the default mesh that comes out of Rhino, which is not very good, to be honest, because uh, the mesher is not great. There is a work in progress version of the mesh, of the mesher, but it's not ready yet. When you have something like this, maybe because you have imported something and you need to uh, transform into NURBS, then there are no tools inside Rhino that can help you with that. And uh, there are translators. I'm not familiar with those, so I cannot uh, speak about them. There are different ways for converting this type of meshes. There are also other programs that have better uh, meshing algorithms. A possible way for doing that actually could be using some of the polygonal modelers that include some form of remeshing. That they are usually used to create a topolo good topology uh, because that's what you want to have in order to convert the mesh to NURBS. Because if we go back to our mesh example here, you want to have good topology, which means that, let me hide this thing. We want to have all quads, so no triangles and no angons, which are quads with more than four edges, and nicely spaced vertices. And then when we have something like this, then we can apply Rhino own conversion system, which is already active in Rhino 6, by the way. So if we have something like this, we can convert them to NURBS instantly. While on the other side, if we have a messy mesh like the one that we have seen before, maybe the best way for uh, converting it to NURBS could be to use a remesher from programs like ZBrush. I believe that also Blender has an, another one, but all the major 3D modelers now are introducing these automatic retopology tools. They are used if you look for this word, you can find different solutions. So if you have a 3D scan of something, the best bet is to go to something like ZBrush and use the Z remesher, I believe that's the name, uh, or what, whatever is the tool that they have. And then once you have something like this, which is a surface that can be smoothed out with the subdivision algorithm, then you can transform it to NURBS. And uh, one thing, if if you have something like this, you need to transform the mesh without applying the subdivision before the conversion, because that is going to be applied automatically by Rhino. So we'll ha you will have that nice, smooth look directly in NURBS. And, and then you'll be able to work with the, those surfaces directly in Rhino. This is something quite new, so it's not something ready for production, but that's the direction I think that we are going towards. I wanted to suggest, if you haven't uh, heard of it, it's called Mesh to Surface. It's a great tool. We sell it on the Novach catalog, and you can download the free trial. And, and also with ZBrush, you can download the free trial, give it a try, and you know, so you'll know for sure. Yes, and, absolutely. And also, um, so this question, I currently own uh, Rhino 5. Would you suggest me to upgrade to Rhino 6 for a better outcome? Well, well uh, Rhino 5, the problem with Rhino 5 is, uh, I mean, it's a very stable program and you can certainly use it for production. And it really depends on the way you use it, the budget that you have. Now, speaking of Grasshopper more specifically, uh, 
I'm not using Rhino 5 that much now, but I that there are already some uh, components that are on uh, Grasshopper for Rhino 6 only. So uh, in order to see the specific differences, you can go to the official official site and documentation. But if uh, I mean, if you want to just to explore different options, then you can by no means you can use the version of Grasshopper for Rhino 5. Rhino 6 is the everything is being developed for Rhino 6 now. It's very stable because obviously now it's uh, it's been released for a while now, and they are actually working on Rhino 7. I don't know, maybe, I, I mean, McNeil is not the fastest company to release new versions, but when they do, I mean, you, you, can, uh, you, you can safely switch the new one usually when you have an official release. So I, I would say the best thing is to, uh, if you want to give me more detail, if the person who has asked this question can give me more details about the specific applications, then maybe I can give an answer which is more specific because it's difficult to say without knowing the specific case. If, if it's your only program for design, then maybe it's worthwhile, but I mean, I, I don't yeah. want to reason with the other people's yeah. pockets here. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. And, you know, we have a, a few, uh, quite a few people that asked if it was possible for you to share the definition files. Okay. Well, uh, I'd be happy to share some of the definition and I don't want to share everything for a reason because sometimes when you, I have spoken a little bit about the workflow, right? And uh, when you start to build a definition like this, uh, you try to get involved quite a lot and uh, in the end, if you are not careful and you organize your definition, you end up with something that is a bit of a mesh, uh, mesh disaster here. So sometimes uh, sharing that kind of definition can be uh, misleading, in my opinion, because some of the things that I've done, uh, I would do them differently. But once you have done and you have reached your goal, there's no reason why you should go back and redo that in a different way. And I don't want to share that thing because I think that can be misleading for, for, for those applications. So if there is a specific, uh, I, I'd, I'd be happy to share some of the definitions that we have seen today and they can be used as building blocks. So uh, I'm going to share it with a YouTube uh, comment uh, and give you also the link as soon as they are ready. I, I just want to clean up some of the things and I want to share with you what we have done here, which is quite a lot. Wow. And um, I'd be happy to share these building blocks. And uh, and I, I, I will see if there is something else that I can share, but I want to share something that can be of help because otherwise I'm sharing something that you're not able to use because it's not documented maybe, or is not properly organized, or just works with a logic that needs to be explained. So. That that's the risk of sharing a, a very complex definition, actually. Uh, but I mean, and if there is an interest for a, a commercial application, then obviously it's different because I'm doing this thing for customers who need specific things, quite complex things, and that is a different case, obviously. But I mean, if we're speaking about sharing, uh, I, I'll see what I can do, and I'll be happy to share what I can. Thank you. So I recommend everybody to go back to the YouTube channel later today and um, and see the rewatch the webinar and then Marco in the comment will share the definitions. And um, that was terrific, Marco. That's some of the feedback we just uh, oh, received and uh, everybody's really happy and excellent, terrific, fantastic. Uh, Superlatives, uh, adjectives for you only today. Okay, thank and, you. I, thank <laughs> I you would everybody. like, um, I would like to take the screen back, and I hope you. Yes, absolutely. You, I hope you guys uh, all done all wrote down um, Marco's. Uh, you took a screenshot of Marco's uh, page and uh, with all this information. And uh, I wanna thank you all for joining us today. I want to show you our product page where you can see there's a huge uh, discount on Rhino going on right now. So uh, 
go on, get get that Rhino Six. I know you want it, and uh, I want to to remind you that uh, again, I'm recording this uh, live broadcast and put it on YouTube and the new channel. Thanks again, Marco. This was wonderful. Take thanks for your extra time with us today, and thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.